Hi, welcome to the Lisa Saunders Show. Um, today's program is going to be very interesting, and I think you're going to really appreciate the information she's going to give us because it's something that I think about and many Americans think about. In fact, Donna Anderson, who is my guest here today, Donna, so, welcome. Thank you for having me back here, Lisa. I'm <laughs> delighted to be here. Well, you have so much information to keep us healthy in all ways. Um, Donna Anderson is the founder and director of Encore Fitness and Wellness. She is a medical exercise specialist and gerontologist with over 30 years of experience in the field of wellness and fitness. Um, Donna, you told me that you'd be willing to talk about Alzheimer's today, yes. and I was really excited about it. You gave me several topics we could discuss, and Alzheimer's, I thought, I've got to talk about that. And when I told, you weren't surprised that I wanted to talk about that because you, no. you read a study, how, isn't that what people, Americans fear most? Yeah, there was a study done in 2012, and it was done in the United States. There were actually studies done in Britain as well. And what it shows is Americans and British uh, people, it's, Alzheimer's is the most feared disease. It outranks cancer, diabetes, <clears throat> excuse me, heart disease. It's the number one fear that people have as they go through their lifespan. Well, I believe it because it's one thing we talk <coughs> about in our family because I've had ancestors that had difficulty. Right. Um, so what can you tell us? You said that you had information on how to prevent or delay Alzheimer's. And you said that Alzheimer's, you can't even prove somebody has Alzheimer's until they're dead and That's it's correct. in the autopsy. That's correct. So please just tell us about Alzheimer's. Well, I'm going to tell you about dementia first, Lisa, okay. if that's okay. Because, yeah, please. Um, really, when someone presents with those symptoms, we really should be calling it dementia. Um, for the most part, um, doctors will distinguish certain behaviors to be more, have more uh, Alzheimer characters. But to be honest with you, we really don't know whether a uh, subject has Alzheimer's till after and they have their brain autopsies. So, and the reason being is that in an Alzheimer's brain, we see plaques and tangles. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, what presents. There's several proteins that produce these plaques and tangles, and that's kind of a hallmark of an Alzheimer's brain. But there's other types of dementia. For example, Alzheimer's, if you look at the different data, they say anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of all dementias will be Alzheimer's dementia. Mm -hmm. If we look at another one is vascular dementia. So vascular dementia is caused by a stiffening and narrowing of the arteries throughout the body and especially as they go to the brain. And that accounts for about 20 percent of all dementias. That's a, that was a lot. You know, when you were telling me about that, that, mm -hmm. you know, you, that was a surprise. So you said there are ways of delaying it or preventing well, it. What, what, how do you want to go about this? We well, what I'm going to just talk about everything. is the current, current things that are done typically for patients that present with dementia okay. these days. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that, okay. about what doctors have in their tool arsenal, so okay. to speak. And then I'd like to talk a little bit more about studies that have gone on, some in this country, but some also in other countries that have supported that there are interventions that can be done that will delay or onset. Okay, so we're to, so go ahead and other and dimensions. So let's talk a little bit about um, the current approach. So currently, when someone presents, there's, uh, by the way, there's about 10 different things that people, if it happens to them, they could go, hmm, I might be coming down with dementia. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a, if, if you go on to alzheimer's.org, you can see the whole list there. Mm -hmm. It could be something like you take your keys and you put them in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. And now if you did it once, you know, maybe you're, just distracted and something's going on in your life, but if you repeatedly do that, mm -hmm. that's one of the signs. Mm -hmm. Another sign would be losing time or place. In other words, you'd wake up in the morning, you think it's six o'clock at night, and it gets a very repetitive thing. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you look, there's 10 little things that would say, well, this is, these are hallmarks of dementia. Mm -hmm. So if you go to a doctor, he's going to do several tests on you. One of them is called a mini mental state examination. Mm -hmm. So they do this exam on you, and basically they can use that and say, yeah, we do think you have, and they can categorize it. You have mild cognitive impairment, or you're actually in a state of dementia. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, so at that time, the doctor has um, a choice to make. He can initiate uh, medications. So currently there's five drugs available mm -hmm. for doctors to use. So, um, the last one that was just approved in 2014 is actually a combination drug, so it is not a new drug. So there have been no new drugs 
since uh, 2003. Mm -hmm. So just think about that amount of time. Over 10 years have passed, no new drug has come to market. Mm -hmm. And the current arsenal they have, actually, it controls more symptoms. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really dramatically slow the progression of the disease. It, it's more symptomatic. It's, um, for some people, they say it delays it. But Alzheimer's and other dementias, currently, there's no cure. Okay. So why is that important? Well, it's important because several things. There are some th um, trials going on right now. They're in phase three, which is great. And these drugs do show promise, oh. which is great. Mm -hmm. However, they're predicting it's going to take another 10 years before any of them come to market. So what are we going to do in this 10-year interval? Well, let's look at the da data that supports that there are interventions that we can use just with ourselves to delay or slow the progression of dementia. Okay. And these involve exercise, diet. Oh, it's always exercise and yeah, diet. Know, There's no know. free well, ride. <laughs> you know, for me, I jump up and down and go, yippee, it's exercise. Right, that's your business. Yeah, yeah. And okay, diet, exercise. Yeah, and diet, exercise, social interaction. Social interaction. And some cognitive change. So a lot of people, luminosity might be something that people out there are familiar with. They've seen it on their web, you know, banner and stuff like that. And you go on and you take these these tests and they get progressively harder. So it's a, it's almost like doing a crossword. I've never heard of, oh, it's a, like a puzzle or it, a game? It could be a puzzle. It's all different things. If you oh, go okay. on, there's many, many different things. Some things are word, some are spatial. So there's many Is different. Is there a website mm -hmm. that you go? Luminosity.com. Oh, OK. And yeah. you go on that and you do those little mental exercises. Yeah. And it's, okay. there's like a monthly fee. You can try it free for a month. And you know, some people feel like, well, this is good. I'm learning new things all the time and it's getting it harder they make it harder and harder and so there we don't have definitive proof that this offers opportunity to everybody you know i personally believe looking at the data that i don't think it's one thing by itself i think we have to look at it as a multi-component program okay so what about adopting the, our life so, so what about the diet or Okay, well, so let's go into some detail about exercise. Okay. The data that we've seen so far supports that, again, perhaps not just aerobic exercise, aerobic exercise is important, especially for vascular dementia, because when we look at vascular dementia, um, as people get older, they have a stiffening of the arteries, but then if you have blockage and things like that, it makes it that much worse. So let's face it, aerobic exercise, if someone starts even in midlife, even late in life, it can definitely So what is the diminish. definition of aerobic exercise? Aerobic exercise is exercise that raises your heart rate to, four, well, at, let's put it, at mild levels, 40 to 65% of your VO2 max. So what a VO2 max, I don't want to get too technical <laughs> here, I'm sorry. But just to go into a little detail, that's how your body uses oxygen to do exercise. Okay. So, you know, another day I'll bring a heart rate chart and I'll show you everything. <laughs> okay. But let's, let's take me for an example, okay? So I'm 60, right? So if I get the numbers, 40, if I take 40% um, of my max heart rate, if, if I did it properly, it'd be 220 minus 60, so that's 160, right, times 60. So that's 96, okay? So 96 would be the lowest level of my heart rate mm -hmm. for me to get aerobic. And you have to have how long does you have to be exercising like that? You know, that? that's, uh, there's a lot of different things out there. Not, recent data has said that you can take a 30 minute session, split it in 10 minute sessions and still get the same benefit. Mm -hmm. I, I prefer that people actually try to go for 30 minutes. Now you this know. is something you do in your practice with Correct. people. Correct. Okay, yes. so you would be figuring it out if they were I do. doing I do. that. I actually do um, VO2 max measurements on clients when they come oh, to okay. my practice. Okay, so they can practice. know that they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I actually determine what their VO2 max is submaximally, and then I can tell them I really want you to exercise within this range. And you know, eventually they learn perceived exertion. So mm -hmm. initially we would measure. We can use the treadmill. We can use a heart rate monitor. We can mm -hmm. measure that heart rate. But in time, they're going to know by their breathing how hard they're working. Should on. they be doing this every day or X number of we times a like week? We say like three to five times a week. Okay. So you, if you have a bad day where you just want to lay in bed all day watching I Love Lucy reruns, you're allowed one or two You're entitled. If you have a reason you need to do that, you should do it. <laughs> but talking about exercise a little bit more, you know, as, as important as aerobic exercise is, a lot of the studies show it's actually more beneficial if they have aerobic exercise 
plus strength training, which could be just body weight strength training, like squats and lunges. Okay. Flexibility exercises. And one thing that hasn't been looked at, but I'm going to go out there on a limb and say, if they tested it, I think it would show efficacy would be balance training. Because balance is a component that diminishes through the lifespan. In other words, as we get older, we lose that ability to, to stay in balance, to stay in proprioception. And that uses a part of the brain that if stimulated, I do think it would be very efficacious to ward And that's off something you do in your practice as well? All the what, time. what does that mean? Somebody's walking across a balance beam? Or what does that mean? No, nope, it, it could be something as simple as holding on to the back of a chair and bring your body forward, bringing one leg back and then letting your arms go. Okay. So, you know, that's so one it's simple, pose. easy things that you would have these at home. You could, you could just stand yourself and put your feet in a tandem position. So in other words, toe to heel and just try to stay there for 10 seconds. And I can guarantee you many people that's cannot hard. do that. That's, yeah. That is hard. And that's just training your body for balance. Yep. Okay. So that's, that's one thing about how exercise could be one of the And you said flexibility. Is that just doing the little exercises? Flexibility is stretching. You know, stretching. flexibility is stretching. So, yep. you, so you really should be doing all those things to protect your brain. That's true. It's very true. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's, you know, the exercise portion. We could go into a little more detail on now, that. Now, on your website, do you have samples? You said you, on your website you can upload all, a lot of this uh, information, information on deme dementia. Right. So you'll show sample exercises? I will, yeah. Or, you know, or, well, the, you know, I will show up as much as I will explain what each exercise is. What, so it, I'll say what kind aerobic, is? Okay. Yeah. So you'll explain at least sure. what the ex. Okay. Definitely. And, and I have YouTube videos, so people are welcome to go to YouTube, you simply put my name, Encore Fitness, and certain videos will pop up. And then um, nutrition, what did you say so about diet? So let's talk about diet. So the other thing they've discovered about dementia, and particularly Alzheimer's, they do believe there's an inflammatory component to it. Mm -hmm. And they also believe it has some relation to insulin resistance, which is about type 2 diabetes. Now I'm not saying, actually type 2 diabetes is a risk factor for dementia and specifically for Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So they've you know, done the research and showed that there is a correlation there. Mm -hmm. So what can we eat food-wise that is anti-inflammatory? Well, that's easy. We should eat foods that are, have antioxidant qualities. So things like blueberries, strawberries, sweet potatoes, pretty much any vegetable that's got a lot of color is going to have antioxidant qualities, which is going to be very helpful to your body. It cleans up the free radicals from your blood. And it's just, and it, you know, if you want to make it really easy, Mediterranean diet, which people could just go in and Google and say, oh, that's what I should be eating. What so olive it? oil. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a balanced diet, you know, that does have fat, it has protein, it has carbohydrates, it's got everything going for it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, whole grain based, fish based, less meat. Um, smaller quantities of meat. If, when you if mean you, meat, do you mean I mean beef, beef and pork and things. How, what's poultry then? What was well, that's a white meat. I, mean, I, I would say that's probably not as, um, you know, I think fish is the gold standard for protein. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, there's nothing wrong with turkey or chicken or anything like that. I'm not saying you can never have red meat at right. all. Right. I'm just saying to limit. Yeah, okay. And to focus on whole grain foods. So, you know, white sugar, white bread, all that stuff. I'm not saying it's bad. I don't believe in bad food, good food, but I do believe we should go towards a diet that does emphasize more whole foods. Because sugar and white flour, be, would that be considered food they that don't cause have, inflammation? I wouldn't, you know, I'm not going to go out on a limb and say that I mm -hmm. think too much sugar probably does cause inflammation, mm -hmm. um, but I won't go out on a limb and say, you know, as a scientist, I'm not going to say they don't directly cause inflammation. I just think we need to go to foods that reduce inflammation. Right, okay. That's what I'm saying. There's kind of a difference. Yeah, there, there is a difference. I can't get it. causation, right. you know, but I will say we, we do have definitive proof that when you go to a diet that's got whole grains, fruits and vegetables and fish and little meat, it's now, helpful. Now, you've given me a lot of other helpful tips, like on your last show, you said you're going to write a book. Are you going to put a lot of your advice for the poor people that don't live near you? <laughs> I, <laughs> over here. <laughs> I think the book that I'm, that's kind of coming to mind right now is actually, um, it is going to put all this together. So okay. it's, it's going to be a program, and I'm calling it the Legacy Project. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm calling it that is, is that I feel I've been given a gift as a person, as a child of 
parents who really took good care of their health. My mm -hmm. dad, recently, he died a year and a half ago. He was n almost 97 years old. Oh. And he was not, he wasn't a health nut by any means, but he made an exercise part of every day. Not, you know, he went on and used the treadmill or bicycle. He would go out and garden. I mean, it was just part of his day. And he was right. very careful with the way he ate. Um, he was very careful with his whole demeanor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I think that has a big effect too. I'll go into that a little bit more because I, I want to talk about this um, thing called the Nun Study in a minute. And we'll offer us some insights as to why this is not a hard thing. Th this is something we could all do to change the legacy right, for our children. Right, a lot of times we all want to get thin to fit into that perfect bathing suit, but honestly, I think I'd be even more motivated <laughs> if I could keep my marbles about exactly. me as I get older. <laughs> well, you know, because that's the legacy project, because this is the legacy to, for us to leave to our children. You know, not just the memories, but the financial legacy as well, because just going to share some numbers, mm -hmm. you know, very quickly with you. So right currently we have 153 billion people with Alzheimer's disease, okay? And it will grow in 2050 to 765 billion people. Currently we're spending 153 billion, that's Medicare and Medicaid, for Alzheimer's in 2015. This will grow, oh, th those are the wow. same numbers, 700, th that wasn't the people, I'm sorry. So it's going to, like, multiply by a factor of about five. Mm -hmm. So um, right now, nearly one in five Medicare dollars, 18% is spent on someone with Alzheimer's. And in 2050, nearly one in three dollars will be spent on Alzheimer's. So this is a, wow. this is a call to action. Right. And the reason why I'm saying we need to do this is they're already doing it in other countries. And what are they doing in other countries? So I'll we'll talk about two studies. So um, there is one called the Finger Study. And it was done in Finland. Um, it was a large study, and they had two groups. So they had one group that was an intervention group, and then they had the control. So they didn't ch tell them to change anything. Mm -hmm. For the intervention group, they controlled several things. They had them do aerobic exercise, strength training, and flexibility training. They didn't do balance work, as far as I know. So they had a schedule for that. They did switch them to a Mediterranean diet. They did do some lifestyle modifications with them. In other words, if they found that they were stressed, they introduced stress redu reduction for them. So they did some lifestyle modifications. They found for the, in two years, they used cognitive tests to test the efficacy of the program. They had a 25% improvement in cognitive ability. 25%? In two years. Wow. Impressive. Yes. Yeah, impressive. Yes. And this has been presented, you know, all over the world and even in the United States and yet there's virtually been no press about it and I just recently watched last week a um, half-day seminar or I don't know what to call it it's a White House conference on aging and they had this advisory board and it was supposed to be about prevention and care of Alzheimer's and I watched it and it was really all about care there was like there was almost nothing on prevention no no, nothing on prevention. It was really disappointing to me to see that. So maybe you are the person, the pioneer, that has to get out there you know. with your book and your videos um, and this program you want to put together. Are you uh, allowed to run a study yourself? You know, it would be very <laughs> difficult to do because I, you know, I think you, you have to almost be part of a big institution to do that. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I'm doing a grassroots effort. Right. It's like... If I got a group of people and they were like, yes, I want to do this program, I would say, let's get together. Let's do this together. Let's form right. a community and show we can document us versus the normal population. Now, people would say, well, that can't be peer-reviewed or anything like that because you didn't go through all the protocols. Right. Who knows? You could get the best people that come in. So in other words, these are people that are already dedicated to fitness and nutrition. So right. that kind of skews so your results. So if nothing else, you could at least start a club. Maybe like, do you have like a club where this is your determined? <laughs> well, I think, you know, I'm setting something on my website. And I think my goal would be like, if anyone wants to be part of, part of the Legacy Project, I would like them to reach out to me and say, yeah, I want to be part of this. And I want to organize workshops. And maybe oh. we'll just get together like the first month, once a week to establish that community and then make sure that everyone's got 
like a buddy. So in either they come in with a friend so they can partner with them or they meet someone there that they can partner because the partnering is very important. Right, to keep accountable to each other. It's even more than that. They, all these studies have shown that community involvement, civic engagement, being, feeling, that feeling of connection. Mm -hmm. So let me go into a little bit why we think that that's so important. So let's talk about the Nun study. Mm -hmm. So the Nun study started in 1991 and it stopped, I believe, in 2002. So it went, you know, for almost 20 years. So that's a long time, right? So David Snowden was the investigator, and he studied a group of almost 700 nuns who were the sisters of Notre Dame, and they were in Minnesota. And they, for the most part, were all of German ancestry. So very interesting, you know, and they transitioned to this country in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. And so let's face it, a very homogeneous population, mm -hmm. right? Some of them had different socioeconomic backgrounds. In other words, some of the women when they joined the sisterhood mm -hmm. came from more well-off backgrounds, mm -hmm. and some sisters came from poorer circumstances. Some were more educated, some of them had PhDs, some of them only had grade school education. Mm -hmm. So he studied them for these 20 years, and the the wonderful thing about this, these sisters were very generous with everything. So he, they let him come in and observe them, number one. So he observed behaviors, managed that, you know, observed it and recorded it. They also took cognitive tests for that whole period of time, 20 years. And mm -hmm. by the way, the oldest sister lived to 107. Wow. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> totally amazing. So, uh, and, and she was fully cognitive. She, she was so with it that when she was uh, 107, she um, told another sister, you need to call my family because I'm dying. And 45 minutes later, she was dead. Wow. Is that, <laughs> who doesn't want to go that way? Who? <laughs> my well, hands up. Well, I want to just die peacefully where I don't know. But well, anyway. <laughs> well, but she, but she was but I guess she, she was, loved the deathbed scene, well, right? she, Well, she was happy about it because she was going where, you know, she right. knew it was a better place. Yeah. Right. But it, it was just a wonderful, wonderful story. He tells many stories in his book called The Nun you know, the nun study. Okay. So, but the point being, these sisters ate the same food pretty as much. As each other. As each other, because they, they right, eat communally, right. obviously. Right. So they had, it was, it's great because it, it reduced a lot of the, the when we do studies, the variables. Right. Yeah, so it controlled that. But there were sisters that exercised more, that were more active. Mm -hmm. And I talked about the educational component. And then some sisters came from um, higher socioeconomic standards. We, the whole study revealed that several things. Number one, education is prote protective to the brain. So is the, it? Yes. Why do you think that is? Because it's, it's, Cause it's something stimulating you got neurons. Because it's something you got in your late teens, early 20s, or do you think if you have an education, now you know how to find out more information? Do I you, think people that get education, I can't say all of them, but many people are very inquisitive. Inquisitive. And I think that inquisitive goes a long way. So even if someone's, like, to, I'll use my father as an example. My father only had an eighth grade education, but he was the most inquisitive person on the earth. Mm -hmm. So he would meet you. He'd want to know all about you. Right. Right? And that would keep him sharp. And then he'd be like, I want, he had a cribbage club once with hundreds of people. And he said, I need to know every name. He needed to know when he walked through the door, and he, he just made sure he knew everybody's name. It mm -hmm. kept him sharp. So Good. I just... The sisters that took up new skills as they got older, they seem to have less incidence of Alzheimer's so, disease. So new skills is important. Like, new skills. Like join a bridge club, learn how to play bridge. Right. Or like I'm learning where, guitar. Oh, I'm, you're learning guitar. I'm learning okay. guitar. Last eight months, that's my new skill. Am I going to hear you out in a local uh, <laughs> restaurant someday? Um, <laughs> I will tell you this. My <laughs> instructor tells me that I'm, I, I could probably play for strangers, but it, I, I, I'd have a hard time playing for people I know. I'd like kind of freeze up and stuff, but it's coming. It's coming. Okay. It's coming. But I think it's great because it's, it's, I used to play piano, and it kind of brings it all back. You so know? you're practicing what you preach. You're learning oh, a new so skill. Important. you got to okay. walk the talk. You right. Gotta. All right. So what else? Did so the... what else is important about the nun study? Attitude. The more cheerful sisters, those sunny side sisters, those are the ones that, two things. Either they did not develop dementia and Alzheimer's, or two, they did, but there was something called cognitive reserve. And this is a hallmark of his book. He talks about cognitive reserve because he does the autopsies on these sisters who seem totally fine, you know, 
had no dementia that he could see on measurement, even when he did the testing. He opens up the brain, there's the plaques and tangles. And he's like, how is that possible? Now, I'm by nature an optimistic, cheerful person, but yeah. what if you're not? Like, I don't know, because I believe cheerful people are just happier and healthier, but I, don't have, I haven't read any studies. But how do you make yeah. somebody that sort of has a tendency to be negative and grumpy? I mean, do you, is there I a way do. to change I actually, them? I actually talk to people about that okay. a lot, because as a gerontologist, you know, as we talked before, Lisa, it's so important to consider not the not just the physiological status of a person, right. but the emotional status and the socio. So, so how how do you c counsel somebody to be less? You hang out cranky. with fun people. <laughs> okay. You choose your friends wisely. Because I think bitterness rots the very soul, and it I just does. see a lot of people that are jealous, bitter. Yes. Um, I think enthusiasm is contagious. Mm -hmm. I think you attract to yourself what you exude. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you're a positive person, it brings more positive attributes into your life. Mm -hmm. And I do think um, just like meditation, there's a mindfulness to being optimistic. Mm -hmm. And gratitude is a huge part of that. I, yeah, when you think about what <clears throat> you have to be thankful for instead of what you don't have. Every day. It just changes your whole outlook. It does. On and, the day. and he would talk about the sisters that were so you know positive and he said, I, you know, I couldn't believe it. You know, I, I thought there's no way I'm going to find Alzheimer's in this brain. And then he'd open the brain and he'd see the plaques and tangles. And he goes, remarkable, totally remarkable. But a lot of them were education and the sunny dispositions and a little bit more exercise, a little bit more, you know, engaged. So really also a good club to join would be some sort of exercise club too. Like, you know, something where you're learning a new skill, yep. but also some sort of exercise walking club right. with friends or hiking club or rowing club it, the more diverse the better I right. mean I really believe that that's something as we get through our lifespan you know I don't use the word aging but as we go through the lifespan some people tend to gravitate to what they know because there's comfort in there mm -hmm. and we're not so inclined to stretch. Well, we only have two minutes left, so Gosh, it went you have so fast. I know, and you wow. have a lot to say. I so do. try to be fast, and we can look on your website, and maybe you can come back, and we can talk about other things that you didn't get to. But in your that few few moments, what what do you really wish people would walk away from this show? The, wa the 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 takeaway here is you can do it. You can leave a legacy to your family by taking care of yourself, looking at exercise the diet that you eat, um, how you treat yourself and treat others, and um, maintaining a now, So what's your website then so people can go and just kind of get this? Right, we'll have more information. It's www.encorefitwell, just like it sounds. <laughs> and you can check on that. We'll have some hints for you so you can start. And I hope to build a community. I'm going to have like a little contact form. So if you want to be part of this mission that we're on, to, oh, so know, people can put on like they want to be get a newsletter from you or right. get some sort of communication so that it's in their inbox. Yes. You have a form for them to fill yes. in so they exactly. can get some of these tips from you. Yeah. Well, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much for Thank coming. You, and I promise I'm going to try to balance myself out of here when I leave. Sounds great. Thank <laughs> well, you thank again. Thank you so much for joining us on the Lisa Saunders Show. And I hope you do all put into practice all that she's told us to do. See you next week.